the feeling of the knife piercing my skin and scraping against the bottom of my rib cage was a symphony of sickening pain. The man who was trying to kill me leaned down, pressing his forearm deeper into my neck, choking me. My left arm was stuck behind my back. I was lying on it. The man's knee was digging into my right hand, keeping it pinned to the ground. His minty breath held undertones of a sour stomach smell. I realized he was chewing gum as the hilt of his knife pressed up against my skin, the blade sending waves of pain through my body as he wiggled it around, doing untold damage to my insides with the blade. How does it feel, baby? He said to me, smiling. I turned my head away and looked over at my wife, who lay face down on our living room floor, another man on top of her, working at pulling off her pajama bottoms without taking his weight off her back. I wanted to feel rage at that moment as my wife stared back at me, the look on her face, one I'd never seen before. It was one of immense sadness, of disappointment, but mostly it was a look of fear. I wanted to experience a surge of adrenaline that would give me superhuman strength. I wanted to be a man from one of those action movies who, despite his wounds, jumps up and dispatches the criminals with ruthless efficiency. I wanted to make my wife proud, but I couldn't. The energy was already draining from me, along with the blood pouring out from around the knife blade embedded in my left side. I looked beyond my wife to Seth, our nine-year-old son. He stood in the dining room entryway, looking with large, uncomprehending eyes at his parents pressed against the floor by two strange men. A third man stood behind Seth, his hands placed on my son's shoulders, smiling down at the scene before him. None of the men wore masks. I was lucid enough to know what that meant for my wife and me. I just prayed they would leave my son alone. He didn't deserve this. We didn't deserve this. None of us did. The two assaulting me and my wife were white, whereas the one holding my shocked son still was Hispanic. All three of them looked to be in their 20s. They all wore dark winter coats and jeans that were tucked into their boots. Jennifer, my wife, had warned me, but I hadn't listened. She'd come home hours earlier, around 5.40 that evening, scared out of her wits. I'd seen it on her face when she came into the living room, where Seth and I were watching a nature documentary. What's wrong? I asked. What happened? She dumped her purse down just inside the living room threshold and marched to the front window, parting the curtains. They're out there, she said. They followed me home. Ooh, I said, getting up from the couch. These men, they were in the Whole Foods on 9th, three of them. They must have been drunk or something, I don't know. What happened? Jennifer took a deep breath and stepped away from the window. They were wandering around inside the store throwing stuff around, harassing people, and just being a general nuisance. I tried to keep my distance, but I wasn't about to let them keep me from shopping. So when I was getting some strawberries, they came up to me and started saying disgusting things, lewd remarks. Jenny's face twisted up into a sneer at the memory. After I don't know how long of this, I couldn't take it anymore, she continued. I yelled at them, I just lost it. I can't even remember what I called them now but it wasn't nice. I felt a fury ignite in my veins. The same fury that men around the world surely experience when someone harasses their woman. I wanted to turn back time, to change the past, to be there in the store with her when this happened. Anyway, Jenny said, a couple of Whole Foods employees came up and escorted these three guys out. They didn't go easily. I thought for a moment they were going to start a fight with the employees, but they didn't. Instead, they kept calling out to me, threatening me. Then they were gone. I thought it was over. But when I came out of the store, I noticed a dirty black Mustang sitting there one row over. I couldn't see in the windows, but something about the car just told me it was them. So I loaded up quickly and came home. But they followed me, David. They followed me here. I stepped up to the window and parted the shades, looking out to the dark street. There was a black Mustang idling at the curb across the street. 
driven by that fury still rolling inside me. I rushed to the entryway closet and groped around inside until I found the baseball bat we kept there. I ran out the front door of the house, hearing, but not really hearing Jenny's protests. The cold January evening enveloped me, but the rage kept me warm as I stormed across our small front yard, gripping the baseball bat in one white knuckled hand. I wasn't sure whether I would knock on the window and tell the men to get out or just go straight to bashing their car. It probably would have been the former, but I never had a chance. The black Mustang roared off down the street before I could reach it to do anything. I stood in the road, watching the taillights fade off in the distance and then disappear from view as the vehicle turned right on Pollard Avenue. I headed back inside, feeling good that I'd scared them off. I made sure to lock the front door behind me. We had dinner and put Seth to bed, but I could tell that Jenny was still worried. Maybe we should call the police, she said to me as we were getting ready for bed. They wouldn't do anything, I said. They'd just tell us to call if they came back. When it came to matters of the police, Jenny usually took my word as bond. Over my years as a journalist, I'd come to know police operations pretty well. Well, she said, maybe we can stay at a hotel tonight. Just pack a few things and go. Jenny, I said looking at her over my toothbrush, newly adorned with toothpaste. I have the alarm set. All the doors and windows are locked. We'll be fine. I just, I have a bad feeling. You're scared. It was a scary thing, that's normal. But you're safe now. We're safe now. The words replayed through my mind as I lay on my living room floor with a gum-chewing murderer on top of me, my blood soaking the carpet beneath me. They had come just after midnight, and they had knocked, or at least one of them had. While I stood at the front door in my robe, asking who it was and what they wanted, one of them was at the back door. I only knew this when they broke one of the small square window panes and opened the back door, causing the alarm to beep for a code. I swiped up the baseball bat from next to the front door and ran to the back of the house, but I wasn't careful, I was stupid. One of them was just inside the doorway to the kitchen, pressed up against the wall, waiting for me. He took advantage of my momentum, sticking a foot out as I went by. I didn't fall, but I stumbled forward, which gave him enough time to come up behind me and press a knife blade to my throat. The Hispanic man came in through the back door and rushed off into the house, smiling as he passed me. He had a large knife of his own. I heard him open the front door, letting the third man into the house. Put the code in, the man with a knife to my throat said, pointing me at the alarm keypad by the back door. No, I said. He snickered. If you ain't, I'm gonna hurt you if you don't do it. My friends just went up to find your hot ass bitch wife. She'll get God if you don't put the f- code in. And if you put in any distress code bullshit, you'll all die when we hear the sirens. You got any kids? Judging by the groceries you're wife bought. I bet you do. You want your kids to die too? I put in the code. I wish I hadn't. I wish I had let the alarm go off. It would have sped up the process. It would have turned a torture murder session into just murder. Better yet, I wish I had called the police right when they started knocking at the door. I knew who it was, and I knew it was trouble. But I thought I could handle it. I was wrong. The man forced me to the living room and held me there while the other two men brought Jenny and Seth down from upstairs. I tried to make a move, but the man holding me brought the knife down and sliced a deep groove in my right pectoral. He hit me in the side of the head and I went down hard on the carpet, landing on my back, my left arm under me. Jenny screamed, which got her a hit in the head from her captor. She fell to the floor, face down. Seth cried out, but the Hispanic man slapped a hand over his mouth. The world went fuzzy with pain for a few long moments, but it came back into sharp focus as the man pierced the skin under my rib cage with his knife. You should really get yourself a gun, the gum-chewing murderer said as he pulled the knife out of my side. Baseball bats only work on punks. I turned my head to see that the man on top of my wife had managed to get her pajama bottoms and underwear off. Her eyes were wrenched shut. Nobody talks to me like you did, the man on top of her said. 
This is what you get, you uppity Beyond this terrible sight, the Hispanic man led Seth out of the room, saying, You don't want to see this, little man. Time to go to sleep. I wrenched my right hand back as hard as I could, trying to free it from under my captor's knee. It moved, shifting the ball of his knee from the back of my palm to the back of my fingers. I bucked, trying to throw him off of me, and then yanked my right hand again, pulling it free. I swung it up in a clumsy punch, which landed just under the gum chewer's jaw. It wasn't much, but it was enough to knock him off balance, which allowed me some movement. I pulled my left arm out from under me, but it was near useless, thanks to the lack of circulation. Taking another shot, I punched for the middle of the man's throat, but missed the mark, causing my fist to glance off his neck. He went back again and I sat up, moving as fast as I could to stand up. The guy was faster. He swung his knife down and stabbed me just above my left collarbone. He pulled the knife out and hit me with a hard left, knocking me back down again. You good, Mason? I heard the man on my wife ask. I'm good. Mason, the gum chewer, said. He's done. Let's get started on the That name hung in my mind as consciousness seeped away from me like blood from a gaping wound. Mason. His name is Mason, I thought. And that darkness was all. I awoke in a hospital room, dull winter sunshine streaming through the window. Jenny, I said to the empty room as understanding came to me. Seth? My heart was suddenly racing, the last waking memories running through my head. The machine next to me started beeping, adding an auditory facet to my delirium, causing my heart to beat even faster. Jenny? I called. Seth? I threw aside the hospital bed covers and moved to get out pausing as pain in my head, my left side, and my upper chest screamed at me to stop. The door to my room opened, and a nurse rushed in. It's okay, Mr. Vance, she said. You're okay now. Please, lie back down. You've been in surgery, but you're okay now. Where are they? I screamed at her. Where are my wife and son? I, I don't know, Mr. Vance. I don't know. You'll have to talk to the police when they come back. They should be here soon. Until then... I need you to lie back and try to relax. I gritted my teeth as the nurse guided me back down onto the bed with a firm hand. She was an older woman, streaks of gray in her fading brown hair. Is Seth okay? I said softly. The nurse just shook her head and shrugged her shoulders. Oh God, they killed him. I said, crying. (laughs) They killed him. I descended into a place deep inside. Going so far down, that I didn't even notice when the nurse left. It was a place surrounded by the scenes that, to me, had only happened moments before. It was a place no man should ever have to go. A dark, swirling, chaotic place full of fear, regret, and hate. So much hate. But like a man freezing to death feels warm just before he dies, I found solace in that dark place and I knew I couldn't survive without its relative protection. I only came back to the surface when the police showed up to tell me what I already knew. Those men had killed my wife and son. They'd left me for dead. Is there anything you can tell us about these guys other than their descriptions? One of the detectives, a short, stocky man with curly hair asked, did you hear a name by chance? No, I said. His name is Mason, I thought. I didn't hear any names. That wasn't the first time the police came to talk to me. The same two homicide detectives came back again when I was in the physical therapy portion of my recovery. They asked the same questions and got the same answers. The thing about going to that deep, dark place inside is that it's full of misery, but it's also a place of freedom in a sense. The freedom from the bounds of morality If you stay in that place long enough, you start to forget what morality even is. And I never left that place. I stayed there throughout the weeks of recovery, through the funeral arrangements, the meetings with lawyers, and the excruciating experience of coming home for the first time since the murders. I couldn't stay in the house. It was too much. So I got an extended stay suite and got to work on my plan to find Mason and his pals. My editor, Jerry Fans was surprised to see me when I came in on a Tuesday, four weeks after the assault. David, he said, standing up from his desk as I walked into his office. 
What are you doing here? I've sent you two emails, Jerry, I said, requesting information about those three stories I did last year. I didn't get a response, so here I am. Well, Jerry said defensively, I just didn't think that was the kind of stuff you should be focusing on right now. What do you want them for anyway? I've been thinking about them, Jerry. It's giving me something to do. I always wanted to do a follow-up. You remember that. Besides, they're my stories, my notes. I just need access to the archives. All right, you got it. If you think it'll help, it's no problem. I do think it will help, Jerry, I said. Fine, good. I'll send you a link now. Take whatever you want. Thank you, I said, and stood there waiting while Jerry sat down at his computer and sent me the link in an email. I verified the access on my phone and then walked out of his office without another word. The notes I was looking for were from a three-part series about supposed paranormal happenings surrounding a strange cult in the city. It wasn't the first time I'd cover things of that nature. In fact, in recent years, there had been an uptick in unexplainable phenomena involving people that had direct and peripheral ties to the cult. I covered crime and, when the stories came up, things like exorcisms, hauntings, and other supernatural happenings. Most of them had reasonable explanations, but not all of them. On my way out of the building, I scanned the notes, picking out the names and factoids that I needed. With that done, it was time to find Mason. Given my connections in the police department, the combination of the black Mustang, the name, and the fact that the guy likely had a record, I didn't think it would be a problem. And it wasn't. But finding out where he lived was only the beginning of my plan. Let's go out tonight, Mason. Have some fun, Petey said. I'm so f- bored. No, I said. How many times do I have to tell you? We gotta lay low for a while. Come on, man, Gabriel said. It's been two months already. If the guy had anything on us, we would be in jail by now. Too f- bad, I said. We're not doing anything illegal until things cool down some more. Besides selling dope, Petey muttered. The f- you say? Nothing. Yeah, that's what I thought. Selling dope is different. It's how we put food on the table. It's what keeps us in this nice house, I said, gesturing around at the living room. I was lounging in a recliner while Petey and Gabriel were sitting on the leather couch. The big screen TV was turned to some movie channel, the volume on low. Well, that's what we're saying, Mason, Gabriel said. Food is important, but so is getting some snatch. I'm about to go crazy if I don't get me some. Besides, Petey said, you're the one that didn't make sure the guy was dead. Well, how about this? I said, how about I take my connect and do my own thing, leaving you to find your own supply of dope to sell. Damn, man. We're just bored is all, Petey said. No need to get all crazy on us. I'm so sick of your I said. That's all you been doing lately. You sound like fucking women. Neither man had anything to say about that, but I was still fuming. Go get me a beer, Gabriel, I said. Gabriel scoffed, but got up off the couch and headed to the kitchen. In preparation for the beer, I took the piece of gum out of my mouth and put it in the ashtray on the table next to my recliner. A crash sounded from the kitchen. What the f*** you doing in there? Petey called, laughing. You fall down? There was no answer aside from a grunt. After a moment, a soft scuffling noise came to my ears. I looked over at Petey, seeing immediately that he was thinking the same thing I was. We both got up quickly, moving hesitantly toward the hallway leading to the kitchen. Wait! I whispered to Petey, grab your gun. He nodded and headed over to his bedroom just off the living room while I tracked back to the table next to my chair, swiping my knife up. We reconvened in the hallway and made our way down it quietly. We stopped at the closed kitchen door and listened. The scuffling sound that had been so loud earlier was fading away. Someone exhaled on the other side of the door and then there was nothing. I held three fingers up, Petey nodded, I dropped one finger, then another, and then the last. We burst through the door to find Gabriel sprawled on the floor in the kitchen, 
his neck sliced open so wide, his head was barely attached to his body. A pool of blood crept out along the linoleum floor around my friend's body. A man stood a few feet away from Petey, knife in hand. He wore a long sleeve plaid shirt buttoned up to his neck. His dark jeans had blood stains at the knees from where he'd been kneeling, working to kill Gabriel. He raised his head and looked at us as we came in. Petey fired, hitting the man high in his chest. He dropped the knife in his hand and went down to his knees, putting one hand up to the bullet hole. Holy sh! it's you, I said. You really thought you could come in here and kill us all? You mother Petey yelled, stepping up to the man and jabbing the pistol against his head. You killed Gabriel. Wait, I said, trying to calm Petey down. Just wait a minute. Don't you recognize this Petey looked up at me. I know who the he is and I don't care. He killed Gabe. This is the guy whose wife thought she could put us in our place. This is the guy who thought he could threaten us with a baseball bat. So f***ing what? Petey said. So what? So what? This is the one that got away, my friend. And here he is, like a bird set free, only to come back, looking for something he'll never find. So we're going to take our time with this f for Gabriel. I stepped around to Gabriel, avoiding the blood, and knelt next to the man, noticing that his lips were moving. I could barely hear the whispered words, and what I heard didn't sound like English. You think praying is gonna help you now? I asked, smiling. The man jerked out at me, growling. I shot my right hand out, hitting him with the butt of the knife. Then I shoved him to the floor on his back. Well, this is familiar, isn't it? I said, straddling him, putting my knees on his hands and my left hand to his neck. He glared up at me, his eyes shining with something I couldn't quite place. I don't know how you survived the last time, but you sure as f want this time, I said, pressing the point of my knife to a spot under his ribs. This is where I did it last time, right? I asked, looking down at the knife, poking into his plaid shirt. Let's see how you do the second time around. I plunged the knife up under his ribs, reveling in the pain I was causing and the convulsing that shook his body. I moved the knife around inside him a little, smiling as he grunted in agony. What the f man? Petey said from behind me. He's smiling. I brought my eyes up from the knife to look at the man's face. Sure enough, he was smiling. He was looking me right in the eyes and smiling, and his lips were still moving. I pulled the knife out and then plunged it in again at a spot a few inches to the left, still looking at his face as I did it. The man was still smiling, still whispering. I squeezed his throat with my left hand, willing him to show me pain and fear, but he still smiled. Before I knew what he was doing, Petey stepped around, pointed his pistol down at the guy's head and pulled the trigger. So close to my head, the sound was deafening. The cartridge ejected and bounced off the cabinet, hitting me in the arm. What the f man? I shouted up at him, my ears ringing. He wouldn't stop smiling, Petey said, looking down at the still smiling dead man. I don't like that. Well, now we have his brains to clean up in a f bullet hole in the floor. Yeah, Petey said. Sorry. I got up and grabbed a stained kitchen towel, then placed it over his face. I wasn't about to admit it, but I was relieved that Petey killed the man. The towel now hiding his face, I went through his pockets, finding nothing but car keys. He hadn't even come with a gun, just a knife. A knife to kill all three of us. I shook my head. Let's get this cleaned up, I said. It's gonna be a long night. Luckily, our neighbors know how to mind their own business. We got the guy and Gabriel into large black trash bags, one down over the head and another coming up to meet it from the feet. We duct taped the trash bags together, using nearly half a roll to ensure that blood didn't leak out of the bags. Then Petey and I moved the bodies out to the backyard, setting them next to the house until we could get rid of them properly. We headed back inside to clean up the considerable amount of blood left behind by the two men. Ah, what the hell, man? I said to Petey as we walked inside. You walked through the guy's blood? No, I didn't, Petey said, stepping through the back door. Well, it sure as hell wasn't me, I said, gesturing at the puddle of blood left by the man I'd killed. There were bloody footsteps leading away from it, back toward the living room. Do I look like I'm barefoot to you? Petey said. He was wearing his boots, 
and the footprints had been made by someone with bare feet. Maybe the guy had a friend with him? I said, whispering now. Get your gun out and follow the footprints. I'll go the other way through the dining room and meet you at the stairs. Petey was staring at the footprints on the floor, not moving. Hey, I said, hitting him in the arm. You hear me? Yeah, yeah, he said, pulling out his pistol. I picked up my knife from the floor and wiped the blood off it with a paper towel. Then I headed out of the kitchen and into the dark dining room, moving slowly. We never used the dining room for eating or for much of anything but storage. There were boxes stacked against the walls, an old punching bag that Petey had bought but never set up, and a number of other odds and ends that were put there and forgotten about. It was dark in the room, the only light coming from the kitchen behind me. I decided not to turn on the light, knowing that it would give me away to whoever was in the house. As I was about halfway through the dining room, something moved in the darkness opposite me. I turned my head quickly, seeing the dark silhouette of a giant spider racing toward me. I cried out and slashed at it, my blade touching nothing but air. One of the thing's legs struck out at me, throwing me two feet back into the wall. I fell down to my knees and scrambled toward the doorway to the entryway, where Petey was supposed to meet me. I rounded the corner and saw Petey's feet near the stairs. Where is he? Petey asked, looking down at me. Did he attack you? In there? I gasped. It's in there. Petey leveled his gun and stepped over to the doorway, then pivoted into the room. After a moment, he turned on the light. There's nothing here, man. I'll check the kitchen. No, I said, standing up. I still had the knife in my right hand. It wasn't a person, I said. It was a spider or something. A spider? Are you kidding me? Get it together, Mason. You check upstairs. I'll check the kitchen. Petey walked over into the living room and headed toward the kitchen. I stood at the foot of the stairs, convincing myself that my imagination was to blame for the spider, even though I could still feel the pain from the hit. I started up the stairs toward the dark second floor, moving slowly. A large and deformed figure with shiny black skin scurried across the top of the stairs and out of sight. I froze. What the f is going on here? I whispered, backing down the stairs. Moving through the living room, I rushed down the hallway toward the kitchen, opening the door to see Petey standing just inside the doorway, his back to me. His arms and head were slumped forward, as if he'd fallen asleep standing up. The puddles of blood on the kitchen floor were still there, but now there were footprints tracked all around the kitchen. Many of them were human prints, but there were also hoof prints, paw prints, and some strange triangular prints that I didn't recognize. Petey, I said. Petey's head came up slightly and he turned around. His eyes were pure white and his lips had been cut through the cheeks, giving him a terrifying bloody <laughs> grin. I cried out as he stepped toward me, bringing my knife up and stabbing him in the chest three times in quick succession. Petey shouted and suddenly his face was normal again. What the f he said, looking down at the shallow wounds in his chest. He brought his gun up and I knew he meant to shoot me with it. So I stepped in close and jammed the knife into his throat with my right hand, grabbing his gun with my left. I pulled the blade out. Blood spewed out of the wound and onto my shirt. Petey looked at me with wide eyes, betrayal written all over his face. He stumbled and fell, adding his own blood to the mess on the kitchen floor. Sensing movement behind me, I dropped the knife and transferred Petey's gun to my right hand. I spun around and saw a man standing behind me, the same man Petey had shot in the head barely 15 minutes earlier. He smiled at me, not a wound visible on him. His shirt was intact and he wasn't bleeding where I'd stabbed him. I raised the gun and fired at him, blinking my eyes at the shot. In the split second it took me to blink, the man had disappeared. No, I said, you're dead, I just saw you die. Laughter echoed through the house, sending chills up my spine. I turned around and ran for the back door, tripping over Petey's body and falling into the puddle of Gabriel's drying blood. I scrambled up and outside. Sure enough, both tightly wrapped bodies were there where we'd set them, but I still had to see, I had to. So I ripped open the black plastic bag over the smaller body's face, revealing the dead man whose wife thought she could f with us and get away with it. He was still there, still dead, and still smiling, although his eyes were closed. But the plaid shirt collar had come down past his collarbone, revealing the top of a strange tattoo. 
My brows furrowed at the strange symbols. He didn't seem like the type, so I ripped down the length of the bag, tearing the duct tape around his abdomen and waist. I unfastened the top few buttons of his shirt, revealing black tattoos covering his upper chest. I ripped his shirt, popping the rest of the buttons off. His whole abdomen was covered with black tattoos of strange symbols, pictures, and words. They all looked fresh too, no more than a couple of weeks old. The strangest ones were around the two stab wounds I'd inflicted. There was a large black oval tattooed under the man's ribs there, running at a diagonal from just below his solar plexus down to his side. The inside of the oval was blank, aside from the two stab wounds. The outside had a bunch of tiny symbols etched around the border. It was like he'd either had the first stab wound commemorated with the tattoos, or he'd known that I was going to stab him there again, just like I did the first time in his house. What the f I said, standing up from his body. I looked around the yard, sensing that something wasn't right, but seeing nothing out of the ordinary. When I turned back around, the man's body was gone, the empty trash bags lying there next to Gabriel's body. Sucking in a breath, I spun around to run back inside and came face to face with the man. His cold hands grabbed my shirt and pulled me close to his smiling face and his still closed eyes. I fought to get away, pushing and hitting him, but he was as immovable as a statue. When our faces were only inches apart, his eyelids shot open, a sickly light spilling out of the sockets. I screamed at what I saw there because I saw myself. I tried to look away, but I couldn't. The images pulled me in until I felt like my very essence was being robbed, ripped from me, raped, and abused. And the longer I watched the images shooting out of the dead man's eyes, the more I realized that they weren't just images. They were real, and they were happening to me. My limbs were broken and chopped off, but I couldn't experience the relief of losing consciousness. I couldn't go into shock and die. I couldn't escape the pain and the fear. Tiny knife blades were shoved into my eyes again and again while my skin was torn off in strips, salt and acid poured into the wounds. My genitals were ripped off my body by massive black hounds, only to reappear and have it done all over again. When one form of torture stopped, another one started. The only breaks were to allow me to experience some fleeting relief, to get my hopes up, only to have them dashed again. And the whole time, through everything, the smiling man was there with me. He was snapping my limbs, stabbing my eyes, and commanding the dogs to attack. And he was laughing the whole time, somehow laughing without moving his lips. He would laugh while he reminded me why I was here and why I would experience nothing but pain for eternity. He reminded me as if I could ever forget. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew this man figured out how to bring me to a place I'd never believed in. He managed to drag me to hell and there was no escape. Something's wrong. An evolutionary instinct deep in my lizard brain sounds the alarm, and my eyes come open in the darkness of my bedroom. I look to my left to see that I'm alone in bed. Real memories push the jumble of dream memories out of the way, reminding me that Shannon is chaperoning a two-day trip to Washington, D.C. for our daughter's sixth grade class. They won't be back until tomorrow. The house is empty. I listen hard for a moment. I know what my empty house sounds like, and although I don't hear any noises that should alarm me, there is something different in the air. It's like an interruption in the background hum of the house. Grabbing my phone off the bedside table tells me that it's just past 2.30 in the morning. The carpet is soft under my feet as I head over to the chair in the corner of the room and grab my pajama bottoms off the armrest. I put them on and I'm reaching for the shirt when I hear the soft creak of a door hinge down the hallway. It's the door to my daughter's room opening. Forgetting about the shirt, I move over to the closet where I keep an old golf club. I'm suddenly regretting the decision Shannon and I made to not purchase a gun for home protection golf club in my right hand, I open my bedroom door quietly, glancing down the dark hallway. There's nothing there, but my daughter's bedroom door is open, and I definitely remember that it was closed when I went to bed. There's a bedroom turned home office on my left, the door closed. 
I moved past it, golf club ready for action. The hallway bathroom is on my right, the door open as it should be. I glance in quickly, making sure it's empty. Next up is my daughter's bedroom on my left. I lean against the wall outside the doorway and try to calm my breathing. Pivoting, I rush into the room, a low growl coming out of my throat, arms tensed and ready to deliver a blow. But there's no one here. The room is empty. Suddenly, I know someone's behind me. I can sense their presence. Stepping forward to gain some room, I start to swing the golf club while turning around. But the club doesn't make it even halfway through its arc before it's yanked out of my grip. And then there's a gloved hand on my face, shoving me backward and slamming me against my daughter's dresser. I cry out as my back hits the knobs and edge of the dresser. The hand shoves me down to the floor, crumpling me like I'm a cardboard cutout. The guy's strength and speed are immense, and it makes me realize that I have no chance of fighting him. Not even close. He slams my head into the floor twice, and the world loses its focus. I feel his steel grip around my ankles. He lifts my legs up and pulls me out of the room, my chest, arms, and face dragging against the carpet. We get to the stairs and he tosses me down. Luckily, they're carpeted. I end up in pain, but nothing feels broken as I come to rest at the foot of the staircase. Risking a glance up at the guy, I see a man I don't recognize. His pronounced brow and craggy face make him seem like a tough guy from a bygone era. He's wearing a black hooded sweatshirt, black jeans, and black boots. He walks down the stairs, not moving fast or slow. I manage to get to my feet and stumble into the kitchen. But I smack the outside of my shin into something as I move, and a sickening pain runs up the side of my leg. I fall to the floor and look back to see what I've hit. But all I see is a scurrying shadow that slips into the living room. Convinced that the stress of the situation and the panic enveloping me are playing tricks on my mind, I scramble to my feet and head toward the kitchen door, the one that leads into the backyard. I hear the man's footsteps coming into the kitchen behind me, but I also hear a kind of wet sloshing sound, like a bowl of cooked pasta being stirred. As I open the door, the cool night air hitting me, I hear the footsteps stop. I don't wonder why. I just lunge out the door and down the three steps to the dew-coated grass in the backyard. Moving toward my neighbor Seth's house, I realize that the pain in my leg isn't from smacking into something. A glance down at it confirms the notion as I see the blood running from a circular wound there, a couple of inches above my right ankle. I clear the low fence between my house and Seth's, then take a moment to inspect the wound a little closer. A half moon sits in the sky above, providing a pale, and somehow sinister gray light by which to see. The wound is about an inch and a half in diameter. It's almost as if someone took an ice cream scoop and swiped a shallow chunk out of my leg. There's nothing that would do that in my house. So I assume it must have been something the intruder set up, a trap he was driving me toward. No time to worry about it now though. I move through Seth's backyard toward the back door. I need to call the police since I left my phone in my room like the genius that I am. I limp up onto his back deck and start dodging around the patio furniture to get to his sliding glass door. But just as I'm moving past the weatherproof fake wicker couch, I see a couple of figures in the dark interior of Seth's house. And I'm almost certain one of them is the intruder from my house. How the hell could he have gotten over here so fast? I crouch down behind the couch on the deck and gaze in through the glass door. Moving to get a better angle, I see that Seth's whole family is sitting in the dining room, in the dark. The craggy-faced intruder stands next to the table while Seth, his wife, and his three teenage children sit around the table in their nightwear, staring blankly at one another. A minute passes, but none of them move. I swallow hard, unable to comprehend what's happening. This makes no sense. Did the intruder know that I would come over here? Does he have a twin brother that's waiting for him to get done at my house before they do God knows what at Seth's house? Whatever the hell is going on, my priority hasn't changed. I need to find a phone to call the police, so I move back down the deck stairs to the yard and head out into the street. My neighbor Trudy lives across from Seth, 
and she's usually up late ever since her husband died several years ago. I look both ways as I reach the street, hoping to see a car coming that I can flag down, or better yet, a police cruiser with its lights on coming around the corner. No joy, the street is deserted. So I limp across as fast as I can, my bare feet cold on the damp asphalt. Trudy's house and all the houses on this side of the street back up to a stretch of undeveloped woodland. This is the edge of the housing development at the edge of the city. So as I head around to Trudy's back door, terrified the guy at my house will look out and see me if I go to the front, I notice something is off about the woods. It takes me a moment to place it, but I realize that there's a gap in the trees just beyond Trudy's property line where there never was one before. Just a dark absence of trees in a spot about 10 yards wide. I can't tell how deep the gap goes, thanks to the darkness. Limping up to the back door is less involved at Trudy's house because she doesn't have an elevated deck like Seth does. I bang on the door and call out her name in a harsh whisper. The lights turn on quickly, as though she were in there waiting for me to show up. But I can't see inside, thanks to some white drapes covering the square of glass in the back door. A shadow obscures some of the light hitting the drapes, making a faint silhouette. It looks to be the shape of Trudy. The deadbolt slides back into the door and the knob turns. Trudy's face appears. Yes, she says. Trudy, I say. There's someone in my house and Seth's house too. I need to use your phone to call the police. She looks at me blankly for a moment, then nods, opening the door further to let me in. I step inside and she shuts and locks the door behind me. She's wearing a pink nightgown and looks like she just woke up. Something really weird is going on, I tell her. She steps over to her kitchen table and looks at me curiously, tilting her head slightly. She must have been asleep when I knocked, but then she opened the door so fast. You said you needed to use the phone, she says, seeming to snap out of it. Yes, please, I say. Trudy nods, looking around and then sticking her hands in the little pockets of her nightgown. She's in her early 60s, but she looks considerably younger, probably because she dyes her graying hair the natural brown color from her younger years. Let me find it, she says. I must have left it upstairs, just stay here. Okay, I say, staying where I am, just a few feet from the back door. I look over my shoulder to make sure the deadbolt is locked, it is. Trudy disappears into the dark adjacent room, and then I hear the creak of her stairs. Noticing that I'm bleeding on her floor, I move over to the counter and grab a wad of paper towels. The circular wound stings as I push the paper towels against it. There's a built-in desk next to the doorway out of the kitchen, and I see that there's a roll of duct tape sitting in the corner amid stacks of mail, a cup with pens, pencils, and scissors, and other various office supplies. I pull out the desk chair and sit down, grabbing the duct tape and wrapping it around my leg to keep the paper towels on. After I call the police, I'll make sure to treat the wound properly, but for now, this will keep me from bleeding all over the floor. My mind goes back to when it happened, and I still can't think of anything in my house that could have made such a wound, especially not anything between the entryway hall and the kitchen doorway. It makes no sense. Then my mind goes back to Seth and his family, the Grables, just sitting there at their table, staring at nothing, and the same guy from my house standing next to them. It's not possible, they must be twins. There's no way he could have gotten over there before me, no way. The stairs creak again as Trudy comes back down. I remain seated in the desk chair, seeing no point in moving. As I wait, my heart finally starts to slow down a bit. She comes back into the kitchen, still looking like she's not quite awake, and hands me the phone. I take it and dial 911. 911. The conversation goes on for several minutes, but after assuring the operator that I'm safe, I hang up and wait for the police and ambulance to show up. Well, I don't think I need an ambulance for the wound on my leg, there's no telling what's been going on over at Seth's house. Better to have one and not need it than need one and not have it. Trudy steps over in front of me to get her phone back. But as I hand her the device, she slaps it out of my hand and grabs me around the neck, throttling me with more strength than she should have. I struggle, squirming in the seat, trying to shove her off me. 
over her left shoulder through the doorway to the rest of the house. I see shadows moving as something comes toward us. Whatever it is moves fast and rope-like appendages seem to whip back and forth quickly. It's dark and shiny with slime or sweat. I can't tell what, it's too dark. As panic starts to trample rational thought, I remember the scissors and the cup on the desk to my right. I lash out with my hand, knocking the cup down and then groping around until I finally feel the tool under my fingers. I grab the scissors in my fist and slam them into the left side of Trudy's body, just under her armpit. She doesn't let go, but she does make a strange sound deep in her throat. I pull the scissors out and slam them into the side of her head, stabbing her in the skull. This time she lets go and straightens up, her eyes wide. I jump out of the chair and move toward the back door. I'm unable to stop myself from turning around to see if I've really just killed my neighbor. Whatever was in the living room, the fast moving shadow and shrouded thing is nowhere to be seen now, as if it was never there to begin with. Trudy turns toward me, her eyes still wide. Her skin seems to bubble around the scissors stuck in her head, moving like a knot of writhing worms under the skin. There's a dark liquid coming out from the wound, but it's not blood. It looks more like oil with an elusive green hue to it. Over to my right, the door to Trudy's basement opens, catching my attention. I look that way and see another Trudy come up from the basement. The same empty look in her eyes, the same pink nightwear, the same everything. Behind her comes another one, and another, and another. They all stare at me with that blank expectancy. A high-pitched sound escapes my throat as my mind rebels against this impossible sight. Somehow, I force my body to move as the Trudys shuffle toward me around the kitchen table. The chilly early morning air hits me as I jump down into Trudy's backyard. Thinking only of getting away, I run toward the woods, covering the 30 yards or so quickly despite my limp. I then duck into the relative darkness provided by the trees. I immediately see the reason for the strange gap in the woods I noticed earlier, although I have no logical explanation for it. Where there were once tall and lush American elm and honey locust trees, there are now only the shriveled remains. They're still identifiable as trees, but they're all lying where they've fallen. It's as if they've experienced years of rot, disease, and decay much quicker than should be possible. And I think I know why. Running along the ground and over these trees are black vine-like veins. Even in the pale moonlight, I can see that they're to blame for the destruction of the trees. The tips of the veins disappear into each dead tree, making them the only logical explanation. I don't dare touch any of these black veins, but as I move deeper into the woods, I stay close to the swath of dead trees they've created. A look over my shoulder reveals that the Trudys aren't following me, at least not that I can see. So I search for a place to sit and watch, a place to wait for the moment the flashing red and blue lights of a police car show up on the street but I can't help but notice that there's a clearing ahead, in the middle of which sits some kind of dark, round structure. Another glance over my shoulder reveals no women in pink nightwear following me, no men in all black with craggy, tough guy faces, and also no flashing lights. The woods seem eerily quiet as I make my way toward the clearing and the strange structure. There are no crickets chirping, and I hear no night birds but there is a faint cracking sound coming from up ahead. As I get closer and start to make out some details of the round structure, I forget all about the cracking sound, pouring all my focus into trying to figure out what this strange object is. It looks like a huge iron ball with holes all around, leading to the dark interior. But iron isn't the right material. I don't know what is. Iron's just the closest my brain can come up with. The holes are arranged over the thing in a grid-like pattern, each about a foot in diameter. I can't see what, if anything, is inside them. They're all just dark. The whole thing is probably 15 feet tall and 15 feet wide, sitting in a clearing of its own making. The black veins lead back to this large sphere. The trees in a wide perimeter around the object have all been killed by the black veins, but I don't know how or why and I can't begin to imagine why these strange veins have killed a 10 yard wide strip of forest leading back toward Trudy's yard. Suddenly, the cracking sound gets louder and I realize it's coming from a tree across the way on the other side of the sphere. I shift around, trying to see it. Sure enough, 
I watch as a tall American elm tree shakes and shrinks and cracks right before my eyes. It goes from a healthy tree with green leaves to a miniature husk with shriveled leaves that fall away and break apart in the ground only moments before the tree itself comes down. It's as if the black veins are sucking the life out of the trees. But why? My question is answered as something moves on the other side of the ball. I can't quite see what it is, but I can hear it. It's a wet, sucking sound. Staying in the cover of the woods, I round the perimeter surrounding the sphere and see that this side of it isn't covered in holes, not yet, at least. There are clear outlines of the holes, but there's also some kind of covering over each of them. And as I continue, I see a mess of black tentacles whipping around, squirming at the mouth of one of these newly opened holes. As the moonlight hits them, the shiny black tentacles give off a sheen of dark green. They don't have suckers like octopus tentacles, but some of them seem to split at the end, flattening out to push against the sphere. Terror descends on me and I run. I don't wait around to see any more of this hellish creature. I just run. I take long, limping strides, ignoring the pain in my leg and staying well away from the slightly different route this time. And before I'm even out of the woods, I notice that the wonderful red and blue lights are there, splashing against my house. Taking my attention from the ground at this beautiful sight, I trip over something and fall. I glance back and see that I've tripped over a body, one that I recognize. In the space of three heaving breaths, I see that this body belongs to the craggy-faced man from my house and from Seth's house. Only this one has been mutilated, holes taken out of him, much like the one from my leg. The bloody holes cover his chest, legs, neck, and even parts of his face. But it's the same guy, same clothes and everything. It's all starting to come together in my mind, but I refuse to believe it. So I get up and run some more, knowing that if I can just get to the cop that's outside my house, all will be well. I pump my legs, breaking out of the woods and heading past Trudy's house. The squad car parked in front of my house comes into view. There's a police officer there, standing a few feet away from his car. But there are other people around too. There's the craggy-faced man stepping out of my house. There's Seth's family stepping out of his house. But there are too many of them, five of each, followed by another craggy-faced man. I look to my right and see a half dozen Trudy's coming out of her house, along with another copy of the dead man from the woods. And to my left, the family that lives across from me has multiplied and is coming out of their house. The policeman looks around in growing alarm. No! I scream, running toward him as all the other people close in. Run! He looks at me with wide eyes, pulling his gun out of his holster. Don't let them touch you! I shout. Beyond the policeman, stepping out of my house, is me. One hole taken out of me, one copy. Stand back! The policeman shouts at the craggy-faced man closest to him, the one that came out of my house. But it's too late. A mess of writhing black tentacles speeds past me on the road and leaps at the policeman. One of its tentacles whips out and takes a chunk out of the officer's right arm. More of these monsters seem to appear out of nowhere. The man fires his gun twice before he's surrounded by these hideous black creatures that look like they came out of hell itself. They whip tentacles out at him, each taking a chunk. He stumbles forward several steps and then falls onto my lawn. I've stopped running and now I stand in the middle of the street. All eyes turn toward me, and I look both ways, seeing that copies of people are coming out of nearly every house on the block, each group coming out with a copy of the craggy-faced tough guy. I think about how many holes were in the man's body in the woods. He must have been the original, robbing houses in the neighborhood when he stumbled on the sphere in the forest. They attacked him, and copied him, and used him to break into the houses. The sphere in the forest wasn't the only one. It can't have been. There are too many copies coming out of all the houses along my street. Too many for just that one sphere, that one ship. A troop carrier, able to suck the life out of trees and transfer it to these creatures. Maybe waking them up from a long sleep, or maybe they just need energy to transform into us. I realize that it's an invasion, and it looks like they've already won. I back up until I hear the wet sound of whipping tentacles behind me. There's nothing left for me to do. I think of my wife and daughter as I close my eyes, and
and I wait for them to finish me off. Stop, I said, talking to Vic. You hear that? Oh, sh**, Vic said. They're home. They're f***ing home, Dale. They're not supposed to be home yet. Without a word, I moved to the stairs and listened hard. We were on the second floor, busy going through the jewelry boxes and looking for expensive watches and electronic gadgets. The sound we'd heard was their garage door opening. Now I heard the door from the garage to the house opening. I moved back to the bedroom and looked at Vic, who stood there, eyes wide. Put everything back, I said, quickly, then we hide. While Vic dumped the jewelry he'd taken back into the boxes, I headed to the bedside table and put the tablet back. Then I went to the closet and put the two expensive watches back where I'd found them. I heard voices from downstairs, a man and a woman. They seemed to be arguing about something. There was a loud thump from down there. And then what sounded like a muffled cry of pain. Something struck me as strange about the thump and the outburst, but I wasn't sure what it was. In my mind, I pictured the man of the house stubbing his toe on something and then crying out. But that didn't explain why it sounded muffled, more muffled than the voices I'd heard just before. I padded out of the walk-in closet and grabbed Vic. You done? I asked. Yeah, it's not perfect, but hopefully they won't notice. Okay, I said. We hide until they go to sleep or leave again. Then we get the hell out of here. There was momentary silence from downstairs, which put my hair on end. I stood there next to Vic, listening hard. Where are you going? The woman downstairs called. I'm making sure everything's locked up. The man called back, but he was closer. It sounded like he was halfway up the stairs. I yanked Vic's sweatshirt, pulling him back toward the walk-in closet. There was an attic access panel just above the built-in shelves at the back of the closet. I pointed at it and signaled that Vic should climb up. He nodded and went over, using the shelves as a ladder to get up there. Meanwhile, I closed the door to the closet and listened. There was a child's bedroom between the stairs and the master bedroom, and it sounded like the man stopped in there. I heard him open the door to the room. Presumably, he walked in and made sure everything was locked up, whatever that meant. But I couldn't hear anything else until he closed the door again about 15 seconds later. I looked over my shoulder to see Vic's sneaker-clad feet disappear into the attic. Turning from the closet door, I heard the man step into the room. What the hell? He said. My heart jumped in my chest, and I guessed the closet door was normally left open. Moving as quickly and as quietly as I could, I climbed the shelves and lifted myself into the attic. I heard the closet door open just as I got the panel seated in the frame. Vic and I didn't breathe. We heard nothing. I pictured the man standing in the closet doorway, his brow furrowed, looking around and trying to remember if he closed the closet door. After a few long moments, I heard him doing something in the bedroom and I finally took a breath. It was early in the afternoon on a spring day and the attic was warm. There was some sunlight filtering into the place through vents on either side of the house, giving us some illumination to see by. We'd watched the couple for a week and had never seen them come home this early before. It wasn't good. We had a long wait ahead of us. I wondered if it was because of the child. When I'd first opened the door to the bedroom, a little girl's bedroom judging by the decor, I was surprised. I'd never seen them with a kid. Not once during the week we were casing the house. Maybe the kid was at camp or something or at a boarding school and today she was coming home. Hey, I whispered to Vic. Did you ever see a kid when we were watching the house? We took turns, so it was possible I'd just missed it on my shifts. No, never. I nodded, it was strange. I figured if we needed to, we could overpower them, but that was a last resort. We never wanted to hurt anyone. We just wanted their jewelry and cash and expensive trinkets, stuff an insurance company would reimburse them for. So violence was to be avoided unless it absolutely couldn't be. The man went back downstairs. I could tell because the bedroom went silent and a minute later, I heard his voice downstairs. Then I listened as both the husband and wife seemed to go into their basement. 
We sat in the attic for several minutes, listening and sweating. Both Vic and I were wearing normal, comfortable clothes aside from the gloves, which were the only items that would have made us look out of place. I wore a long sleeve blue and black flannel shirt, jeans, and sneakers. Vic wore a dark gray sweatshirt, black jeans, and sneakers. We also both had baseball caps on. Still, the attic had trapped much of the day's heat in, and I was starting to worry that we'd end up with heat stroke if we had to stay for hours. So when I didn't hear anything else from downstairs for several minutes, I decided we should try to get out of the house. I climbed down first, carefully, listening hard for movement from the floor below. I heard none. Leaving Vic up in the attic, watching through the access hole for me, I made my way about halfway down the stairs before I could even hear the couple in the basement. It sounded like they were working, maybe on some kind of remodeling project. I heard lots of taping, and figured they might be getting ready to paint a room down there or something. Figuring now was the best time to leave, I headed back up to get Vic. We made it down the stairs and were creeping toward the front door when we heard the sound of an electric saw roaring to life, followed by a scream coming from the basement. It was a man's scream, long and terrible and full of pain. A wave of fear traveled up my spine and I froze at the noise. I looked over my shoulder to see Vic's wide, terrified eyes staring back at me. I rushed to the front door and tried to open it, but it was locked and the deadbolt required a key to unlock it from both sides. I looked around frantically for a key set nearby or a bunch of them hanging from a key ring, but I didn't see any keys. The door was solid wood and there was no way to break through it easily. It would have taken an ax and an hour of work. Vic looked over my shoulder and saw the dilemma. What the hell, man? He said, moving over to a nearby window and fumbling with the latch. He got it undone, but when he tried to lift the window, it moved about a quarter of an inch before stopping. He pulled on it again, but it wouldn't move. Out of the way, I whispered. Let me try. Vic moved and I took up his position. I lifted, but I couldn't get it to move either. Then I realized why. There was a small metal mechanism affixed to the track just above the window. It stopped the progress of the window simply by blocking it, effectively locking the window down unless you had the key to take the mechanism off. Look, I said, pointing at the mechanism. What the hell is this place, man? He said, as if in answer, another terrified scream rang up from the basement. I moved to the next window in line tossing the curtains aside only to see another of those locked mechanisms. When I moved to the next window, I bumped into a chair there, lifting it off the ground about an inch. It came back down with a dull thump. Vic and I froze, hoping they hadn't heard it from downstairs. A whimper from the basement was suddenly cut off, like a hand had been slapped down over the guy's mouth. The whole house went silent. They'd heard the thump, and were listening for further movement. Then I heard the barely audible sound of harsh whispering. I mouthed, move, to Vic, and tiptoed away from the window toward the garage where we'd come into the house. We had a friend that could hack into phones and duplicate the garage door opener apps that many rich people had on their phones. It was how we got into all the houses we robbed. So if we could just make it back to the garage, we could make it out but the problem was that we had to pass the stairs to the basement to get to that side of the house. As we moved through the hallway that traversed the house, heading toward the garage, I could hear someone coming up the stairs. The door opened just as Vic and I turned out of the hallway and into the kitchen. We made it into the pantry and closed the door without producing much noise. Since the hallway ended at the door to the garage, we would have been spotted easily. So once again, we had to wait it out and hope they didn't find us. Who's there? The husband's voice called from the hallway. I'm calling the police. The words sounded hollow, and I knew he wouldn't make good on his threat, not when they were torturing someone in their basement. So we kept quiet in the pantry. Is there someone here? The woman's voice said. I hadn't heard her coming up the basement steps. She was light on her feet. I don't know. Let's check the windows and doors again. What if it's their friends? The woman said. What if they followed us? No one followed us. It's probably nothing. We're just a little keyed up, that's all. 
I'm going to check the windows in the living room. Okay, I'll check the dining room windows. I heard the man walk off, back toward the side of the house we'd just been on. I didn't hear the woman, but I figured I wouldn't. Maybe she wasn't wearing shoes or something. Turning the knob on the pantry door slowly, I opened it a crack and peered out, looking at a slice of the kitchen. Suddenly, the woman came into view, nearly causing me to cry out in surprise. She was wearing old, paint-spotted clothes, and her sandy brown hair was pulled back in a ponytail. Her hands and forearms were splashed with blood. She stepped to the sink, turned on the water, and started scrubbing her hands, the water coming away pink. I didn't dare close the pantry door again, fearing she'd see the movement out of the corner of her eye. All that blood. These people are sick. A pair of serial killers. Maybe they'd even killed their daughter, if they'd ever had one. Just beyond the woman, a portly bald man in his underwear stumbled into the kitchen. This time I did make a sound, but it was lost over the woman's cry of surprise. The man was covered in blood and his right hand was missing at the wrist. The gory wound made me sure that he'd just suffered it recently. There was a thick black zip tie just under the nub, acting as a tourniquet to staunch the flow of blood. His pair of white underwear was stained with blood at the crotch and the red liquid was dripping steadily through the fabric. I didn't even want to think about what they'd done to him down there. Preston! The woman screamed, stepping with dripping hands over to a knife block on the counter. The injured man was clearly delirious. He stumbled toward the woman saying, please, please, please. The woman grabbed a large knife out of the block and threw it at the man. The blade stuck into his upper chest, but its momentum took it out again. It tumbled over his shoulder and fell to the floor behind him, leaving behind a gash in his pale skin. He barely reacted to the wound, but he did turn and look at the knife on the ground. Meanwhile, the woman was grabbing another one out of the block And when the injured man bent over to pick up the knife off the floor, the woman lunged at him, stabbing him in the back three times. This time, the man did cry out, and he fell to the ground, his bulk hiding the knife. The woman screamed out and stabbed him several more times before the husband, Preston, came running into the kitchen. Are you okay? He asked the woman. She was sobbing, but she nodded. How did he get out? Preston asked. The woman shook her head. Preston came around and helped his wife up. She left the knife embedded in the man's back. I doubted she would need it again. The guy looked dead. Stay here, Preston said to her once he got her leaning against the counter. I'm going to check on the other one. He walked out of the kitchen and I heard his footsteps fading away as he went down the steps. There was another person down in the basement and if these sickos caught us, we'd be dead too. I knew we didn't have a chance. We had to make a move, and now was our chance. Turning around, I found a large can of peas on a pantry shelf. Vic watched me grab it with a question in his eyes. He didn't dare speak, and he hadn't seen what I'd seen through the gap in the door. He'd only heard the commotion. I put a finger to my lips before turning around to face the door again. Taking a deep breath, I gripped the can tightly in my gloved hand, rehearsing what I was about to do in my head. I shoved the door open and lunged out at the woman, who turned to face me just as I reached her. Her eyes were wide with surprise as I brought the can down on her head. The heavy can made a dull thump as it caught her on the curve of her forehead, immediately splitting the skin open. She stumbled back, blood pouring down her face. I moved in on her, and just as she was about to open her mouth to scream, I slammed the can down again, hitting her in the face this time. I felt the left side of her face cave in under the blow. Her body went limp and she fell back, smacking her head against the tile floor hard enough to make a crunching sound. Come on, I said to Vic, who looked with sickening fear at the two bodies lying on the kitchen floor. We ran through the hallway toward the garage, no longer worried about being quiet. I still had the dented can of peas in my right hand, so I used the left to twist the doorknob and pull. The door didn't open. It was locked and, like the front door, it required a key to unlock. I shouted. We need to break a window, move! Vic and I turned into the nearby dining room, which had windows and two walls. The sound of running footsteps coming up the stairs sent an electric fear through my body. Vic picked up a wooden chair from the dining room table 
but I knew we'd never make it out in time. Not before the husband got up here. And who knows what kind of weapon he'd have with him. I moved quickly to the wall by the doorway from the hall, the most likely place for the husband to enter the room. Holding the can up, I waited for him there, listening hard. Just as Vic smashed the window with the chair, the guy rushed into the room. He yelled out at Vic, rushing past me without a glance. He had a machete in his right hand, which he raised as he moved directly toward Vic. I stepped up behind him and slammed the can down on the back of his head, causing him to stumble forward, tripping and falling headfirst into the smashed window, right onto a piece of jagged glass sticking up out of the bottom frame. He dropped the machete and stood up, pulling the glass out of his neck. He put both hands to his neck, which was pouring blood. His hands did little to stop the flow. He looked at Vic and then turned to look at me. His brow furrowed as he couldn't understand what was happening. Then he fell down and emptied the rest of his blood onto the plush carpet of the dining room floor. Oh my God, Vic said, putting his gloved hands to his head. Oh my God, we just killed two people. We need to get the out of here. I'm gonna be sick. Go, I said, get out of here. I'll meet you back at the car. I felt like I was going to be sick too, but I didn't say so. I was trying my best to keep it together. What are you going to do? Vic asked. They have another guy downstairs. I can't just leave him. These sickos probably have him tied up. He might die if I don't let him go. Vic looked at me for a long moment. Then he turned to the window and started kicking the pieces of glass, including the bloody one, out of the frame so he could escape. I tossed the can of peas on the ground and rushed down the stairs and into the basement. There was plastic sheeting all over the unfinished main room and a medical table in the middle of the space with built-in restraints. The table was coated with blood. It looked like one of the wrist straps had broken, which was probably how the guy managed to get out and go upstairs. A workbench sat to the side, covered in medical instruments and construction tools. There was an electric saw there, its blade covered in blood. There were two large dog cages in the corner of the room, one of them empty and open. The other one contained a man who looked up at me with fearful, pleading eyes. His mouth was covered with silver duct tape and his hands were similarly bound. He had long, stringy hair and an average body type. His jeans and t-shirt looked filthy. I ran over to the cage, noticing that it was fastened with a large padlock that required a key. The guy pointed at his pocket and then pointed upstairs. It wasn't hard to figure out what he was saying. I found the keys in the husband's pocket and used them to let the guy out. Then I used some scissors from the workbench to cut the tape. Thank you, thank you so much, he said. These people are crazy, man. They were going to kill me. I know, I'd call the police if I were you. They're both dead. Relief came over the guy's face. He nodded. If you do call the police, I was never here, okay? I said to him. This meant he'd have to take the blame for their deaths, but it would be self-defense, surely. I think it's best if I just leave, he said. I nodded. We headed upstairs and I used the keys to unlock the front door. The guy thanked me again and then ran off. I ran the other way and got into the car parked a couple of blocks away. Vic was there waiting. As soon as I got in, he put the car in gear and we drove off. Vic and I got back to my apartment on the other side of town. I turned on the news immediately I knew it would probably be a while before anyone found them, but I couldn't help myself. I'd leave the news on for a day if that's what it took. I wanted to ensure we got away clean. As we were sitting on my couch, unsure what to do with ourselves, a news story came on that caught our attention. Today marks a year since eight-year-old Lily Shaw went missing last spring, the blonde male newscaster said. The picture of a smiling little girl came on the screen. The young girl's parents, Preston and Leslie Shaw had this to say shortly after their daughter's disappearance. A video of the husband and wife whose house we'd just been at came on the screen. They were huddled together, arms around each other, sitting on a couch in their house. Please, we just want our daughter back, Preston said. If the people who took her are listening, we just want her back. That's all we care about. So if anyone has any information on her whereabouts, we're offering a $500,000 reward, no questions asked. We just want her back. The newscaster came back on the screen. 
Eyewitnesses to Lily Shaw's disappearance identified two men who police say are known sex offenders, Tim Duke and Kelvin Reynolds. Two mugshots came on the screen. Both faces I recognized immediately. One of them, Tim Duke, was lying dead on the Shaw's kitchen floor across town. The other one I'd set free barely an hour ago. Anyone with information on either of these men should call the Crime Stoppers hotline immediately. This time, I couldn't keep the sickness down. I leaned over and vomited on my floor. What did we do? Vic said. What the f*** did we do? Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video. You can also check out some more of my animated horror stories right here.